Hi everybody, welcome back. Glad you could tune in again. I thought it might be helpful to provide some introductions to books of the Bible to help you in your Bible reading on your own day by day or as a family, uh, maybe to give you a, a sense of where some of the books are going in the case of uh, lesser known parts of the Bible or to encourage you to look again at parts of the scriptures which are more familiar to you. Obviously in just a few minutes we're not going to be able to go into lots of detail about any of the particular books of the Bible but I hope you might find it helpful. I've certainly found it helpful in the past when you're trying to get into a book of the Bible for the first time to have a kind of bird's eye view of the whole landscape so that you then know the shape of things generally and you can get into more of the detail without getting kind of lost and failing to see the wood for the trees. So what we'll try and do is identify where the individual books come in the Bible's overall narrative. We'll try and get a sense of the overall structure and shape of the book, the main themes of it, and then maybe we'll look at a couple of details just to give a sense of how the books teach whatever it is that they teach. So let's start with Genesis. Everybody knows what Genesis is about. Uh, Genesis announces its message in the very first word, like several books of the Old Testament. In fact, in the beginning, uh, one word in Hebrew, and it is the story of beginnings. It is the story first of the beginnings of all things, the cosmos and the created world itself and of human beings in particular. And then it is the story of the beginnings of the people of God from Genesis 12 onwards. And it's quite common actually to structure the book in that way with Genesis 1 to 11, sometimes called the primeval history. I'm not sure that's a very helpful word, but there it is. That's how commentators refer to it sometimes. And then the Genesis 12 to 50, the history of the people of God. And basically, you kind of know the story of what happens. You've got the creation of humanity uh, after the creation of all things in Genesis chapter 1. And pretty soon things go downhill with the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And you've got all the echoes and the chaos resulting from that in the next uh, six, seven, eight chapters or so down to Genesis chapter 11, where you find the... Uh, uh, the, pri the proud attempt by arrogant humanity to build a tower to reach up to God, which God doesn't think very much of. And he goes down to see this puny little tower that they've built and he scatters humanity across the whole earth. So by the, the end of chapter 11, you've got kind of human sin wreaking havoc in the kind of way you'd expect it to. And in response to that, God then takes the initiative again in Genesis chapter 12 by calling Abraham, one man from among the nations, with whom he plans to begin a new humanity, like a seed of righteousness in the midst of an ocean of uh, depravity and wickedness. And from that seed, he will bring his blessing and his uh, reconciliation to the whole world. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 12 then is kind of a turning point. It's quite a significant moment. And the first three verses in particular contain a threefold promise, which is worth looking at briefly. In it, God commands Abraham to go to a place that he will show him, and he promises him three things. First, uh, land. When you get there, I'll give you a land. Then second, he promises him many descendants, a great nation, of a great community of people who uh, will be the new people of God, so to speak. And then thirdly, he promises to be present with them, to bless them. I will bless you, he says. And so you can think of the threefold promise that God makes to Abraham, land, people, blessing in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And all of those things will, one way or another, somehow be provided for anyone in the world, for the whole world, for anyone who wishes to turn to the living God. Anyone who blesses Abraham in the language of Genesis 12 will be blessed by God. So land, people, blessing for the whole world. That's the promise at that hinge, that cornerstone in Genesis 12. Now, those verses actually turn out to be really significant for structuring, in a sense, the whole of the rest of the Bible, certainly the next few books of the Bible. And one way of analysing Leviticus, or Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy and so on is to ask ourselves the question, well, which aspects of those promises are these particular books focusing on? And if we ask that question of the rest of the book of Genesis, the answer is very clear. The rest of the book of Genesis focuses on the promise to give Abraham offspring. It's the people aspect of the promise. Against the odds and against what looked like insuperable barriers, God somehow provides for Abraham a son, Isaac, and then another a grandson, uh, Jacob. And then finally, Jacob has 12 sons who, roughly speaking, not quite exactly, but roughly speaking, end up corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of God. 
Now, I spoke about those barriers. Uh, that's a very significant aspect of that part of the narrative from chapter 12 through to chapter 50. Because just think of all the problems that, um, so to speak, God runs into in, in seeking to fulfill that promise. Uh, Abraham's very old. There's a famine. Almost the first thing that Abraham does is to give his wife away. Not the smartest thing to do, you might think, if you've received the promise to have many descendants. Uh, the, the, as soon as the multiple sons are born to Jacob, they all start getting uh, uh, angry with each other. They start fighting and bickering among themselves. And before long, they're plotting to kill one of their number. It's really chaotic and terrible. It's the world's first and worst dysfunctional family, really. And so within that framework, what you're seeing is how God, against the odds, against natural barriers, and against even the barriers of human sinfulness, somehow still manages to keep his promise to his people. And by the end of Genesis, you've got not a huge number of people. You've got about 70 people, it says. That actually, it says that in Exodus chapter 1, which we'll come to uh, shortly. Not in this video, next. Uh, and anyway, but you're on the way to seeing that people promise fulfilled. Now, just a couple of other points of interest which are worth thinking about in Genesis. Uh, getting into some of the details. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, where you see the... Um, paradigmatic act of human sinfulness. Uh, this, is of, this is the original sin. It's often called original. It, it's uh, connected with the doctrine of original sin, uh, which, among other things, means the first sin, the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden when they took and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this is the moment when sin first enters into the world. This creates the new problem that somehow God must find a solution to. But it's more than just the entrance of sin into the world. It's actually, in many senses, also the paradigmatic narrative that describes what human sin is like. And especially, actually, in relationships between men and women. If you want to know what goes wrong in marriages, look at Genesis 3. And what you've actually got is uh, a husband who first fails to take responsibility for caring for his wife as he should, as he should, and then... Uh, who starts to blame her when things go wrong. Uh, and then we're told in, later in Genesis 3 is going to become aggressive and domineering towards her. Meanwhile, you have a, uh, a, a wife who uh, takes uh, responsibilities that she ought not to take or takes on tasks that she ought not to have taken, in part because of her husband's negligence, and then uh, who begins to uh, blame her circumstances and so on for the mess that she and her husband have got themselves into. It's actually uh, a, a quite distressing narrative to read, because when you read it against the background of the kinds of problems that one sees in marriages and other relationships nowadays, you suddenly begin to realise just how unbelievably insightful it is as a almost a psychological and certainly theological analysis of what goes wrong in the human heart. So that's Genesis 3, well worth looking at. Also, just one thing to bear in mind later in the book, Joseph is unbelievably significant. From Genesis 37 onwards, all the way to the end of Genesis 50, Joseph dominates the horizons. Um, in fact, it's, it's quite striking if you just look at Genesis chapter 37 verse 2, um, it, it introduces uh, the, the narrative of Jacob, these are the generations of Jacob, and that phrase translated these are the generations of is another structuring device throughout Genesis which introduces a new section of narrative. These are the generations of Jacob. The very next word is Joseph. It's almost as though Joseph is so significant and so dominant a character that he swallows up even his father Jacob's significance in the narrative. And it's worth asking why that is. I mean, he doesn't start off exactly brilliantly, at least not uh, the way that I read the text in chapter 37. He doesn't look like the ideal little brother for all the older sons of Jacob. But the one thing that he does do right is when he's faced with the same kind of test that so many other people are faced with in Genesis. That is, the test of relational faithfulness, faithfulness in marriage, faithfulness in relationships between men and women, Joseph responds well. Everybody else is a train wreck in the book of Genesis. If you read, go back and read from chapter 3 onwards again and notice how many different ways relationships between men and women can go wrong. There are a couple of dozen different distinct failings. But when Joseph meets his test with Potiphar's wife, of course, he remains faithful. And so 
within that framework then, it's as though Joseph's faithfulness in that context is almost the key to his significance. It's that that sets him apart. Initially lands him in trouble, of course, uh, not his own doing on that occasion, but eventually the Lord is with Joseph and he prospered. And so by the end of the book, um, you've got uh, the family all reunited again in the wrong place in Egypt. Uh, and that's a land of idolatry and so on. But nonetheless, at least the family is together. They're on the way to the fulfillment of the promise in Genesis chapter 12. There we are. A bit of a glimpse at the book of Genesis. Hope that's helpful. Uh, the Lord bless you and bye for now.